og de lige har sat sig. Så. Mm. Distinguished guests, on behalf of DTU, it is my privilege and pleasure to welcome you all to this very special Ørsted lecture, Andreas Mogensen, live from the International Space Station. My name is Nikolaj Sonne, and I will, to the best of my ability, lead you through this arrangement this afternoon. As always, be skeptical. The thing is, I have a thing in my ear. Um, it's NASA related, so I have that to deal with besides the other voices. With me on stage, I have Professor Anja C. Andersen from Niels Bohr Institute, Per Lundahl Thompson from DTU Space, and to top off the sandwich of academic wisdom, Professor Jon Leif Jørgensen from DTU Space. Give him a hand. We will be talking about some of the experiments that Andreas has been busy with in the last few months, what they are, what they do, and touch upon some preliminary results. And of course, reaching for the stars, trying to, not answer, but you know, uh, treat the question, why do we science? This fireside chat is fo followed by the main course, which is, of course, the live connection and Q&A with Andreas. But first, as an appetizer, it's a pleasure to welcome Provost here at DCU, Rasmus Larsen. Rasmus, the stage is all yours. Give him a big hand. Dear students and colleagues, dear neighbors, dear family and friends, dear guests. Welcome to DTU. Welcome to Ørsted University. Welcome to an Ørsted Lecture Special. In the Ørsted Lecture Series, we invite the top people in the world to talk about their work. And as Andreas Mogensen is really such a person, not just because he's the only Danish astronaut, but because he's a top astronaut internationally of his generation of astronauts. And we can see that, small signs of that, from the fact that he was pilot of the spacecraft that took him to the space station, and he is commander of the space station while he's there. Today's event is co-organized with the European Space Agency and with Omreisen, the National Space Journey Dissemination Program. And as it turns out, today's event takes place on a very special day, namely on the day of the 25th anniversary of Denmark's entry into the space age. So on February 23, 1999, Denmark made a giant leap into the space age by the launch of the Ørsted satellite into orbit of the Earth. The Ørsted satellite was built at DTU with contributions from Danish industry. Since then, it's had it has been a remarkable development of space technology in Denmark. And just as uh, a small sign of that, we can look at our own department of space research and space technology. DTU Space is one of the largest university departments in the world concerning space research and space technology. And the department holds an unofficial world record of most instruments flying on international space missions. In this case, more than 100 DTU instruments are flying in, in space. The Ørsted satellite was also remarkable. It has, it's still flying, and it has 
for much longer than it's expected, sent data of the Earth's magnetic field to us uh, here on the planet. And we have learned things about the nature of the planet, and we have learned important things about uh, how electronics uh, can survive in, in space. We have a very exciting program uh, ahead of us. Personally, I'm fascinated both by the exploration of the universe, by the technology that we built to do that exploration, the quality demands of durability and uh, reliability of that technology. And finally, I'm fascinated by the wonderful uh, results we see of those missions, how we can observe our own planet, learn things about how the climate develops and how uh, the human-induced climate change changes the condition of life on Earth. We can monitor it, how it develops, and how hopefully it will improve with all the things that we do uh, here on Earth. Let that be the last uh, from me. And uh, with you, I look forward to uh, the wonderful program ahead of us. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Rasmus. And also, thank you for hosting all of us today. Um, I used to work in a company where we, uh, we sang each morning. And since it's the Earth Satellite's 25th launch day, I hope <laughs> that you will now sing with me. Happy birthday, but of course, it's a launch day, right? So, everyone, please. Happy launch day to you. Happy launch day to you. Happy launch day, dear Earth. Happy launch. It's a little swear word <laughs> that in, in Danish there. Um, and it came out in the middle of a TV debate where some journalists thought that it was equally good points of view to assume whether the earth was flat or round, right? And, and, um, and I was like, well, we're not going to move forward if we keep moving backwards. So, uh, so I got a little upset. <laughs> and and my, my mom got very unhappy with me for swearing on TV. But <laughs> so even when you're my age, your mom still calls you and goes, I thought I had raised you better. <laughs> swearing shows your emotion. <laughs> yeah. So you shouldn't be too, too shy about that. I don't think so. Um, it's the only option I had. They put me in a little box, so I wasn't in the same room as the guy, <laughs> so I couldn't. <laughs> <laughs> um, getting back to the serious stuff. Why, why, why do we science? It's fun. It's inspiring. Uh, it uh, stimulates your curiosity. Um, it's a little bit uh, being part of the big puzzle being capable of uh, answering the bigger questions in life. So that's what's driving me to be part of some of, uh, of the stuff that I'm doing. So it's uh, basically because it's fun. But science is also the most important thing. It's the basic most important thing that humanity has done. It's basically what's bringing us forward, right? If we didn't do science, we would still be in the Stone Age because we didn't stop with the Stone Age because we ran out of stone. That's just a theory. <laughs> well, I think it was because somebody came up with a better idea, right, than stones. They were like, stones are great, there's lots of them, but we could do other things. Mm -hmm. John? Science is uh, just formalized curiosity. It's uh, in us all, and uh, we that are so lucky that gets to work with our uh, innermost um, drive uh, are, of course, very happy about this, but science is in us all. It's uh, what drives you to uh, curiosity of what, why did this happen? And uh, we then try to find formalized and useful answers to this. Um, according to the internet, uh, less than 700 people have actually been to space, while we're almost 8 billion stuck down here. So why is, why is space important when it comes to science? Because it's difficult. So actually, if you have to tackle a really difficult problem, 
you take sort of your best brains and let them work together and then they find solutions and these solutions are going to be super novel and you're going to be able to use them for many other things and that's what we see in space you know that everything that we invent to be able to keep andreas alive up in space can be used for the benefit of many people on earth and because when we're in space we can do things and observe things we cannot do on Earth. That's what you will see with Andreas uh, in a bit. The things that happens on the ISS uh, could not be done on the ground. We do observations there that would be totally impossible to do here on the ground. So that's another reason to go to space is, of course, to, uh, to uh, get a better knowledge of uh, our own planet, uh, the way we uh, actually move it uh, in the one or the other direction. But we also, as Sanya says, uh, do uh, invent new stuff that is extremely useful for us here at the ground. Mm -hmm. So it's both uh, for the humanity in uh, prosperity and uh, in knowledge. And space I is the only way you can get this overview of the Earth. I mean, having point-based measurements on Earth doesn't bring you the global picture, the big picture. The only way to get that is getting out there, look at the Earth, or look. Uh, away from the Earth, of course, if you're interested in that, uh, to get the big picture. Um, I know uh, that Andreas, he's an adjunct professor here at DTU. Um, first, how does one become a professor without actually having to teach? It's, it's just, I, I really... Oh, this is, this is yeah, a, I'm not a this real an academic, right? <laughs> he no, is, but what, um, what does it mean for you as an institution uh, to have him here? I've been working uh, with Andreas uh, as first as a student, later as a PhD. Uh, he has constantly worked on the missions that uh, we here at DTU have been entertaining, not just at DTU, at uh, places elsewhere, at Airbus, for instance, uh, at uh, some other space companies in Britain and in the universities in the uh, US, always working with our technology, but just from a different po spot. So um, when we got the chance here to ask him whether he would like to f more formally join us, uh, it is very obvious that he can do good things. Uh, this is not the mission of today we're talking about, but that is really clean and uh, drinkable water for the entire humanity that we are studying here. And I'm quite sure he will be teaching before he retires, and I think he would like it. I mean, he's teaching other astronauts, he's giving public talks, he's teaching all of us. So, I mean, teaching is in his uh, DNA, and he's very good at it. Um, Andreas' current mission is called Hugin, Hugin in Norse mythology, uh, sort of the chief god. Uh, Odin, he has two ravens. They fly out into the world during the day and then they return at night with news and one of them is, is named Hugin. And the mission, of course, comprises of a lot of different scientific work. And I'd like to dive down deeper into uh, some specifics. Um, according to Wikipedia, I, the ISS has about a thousand cubic meters of volume, which is actually around ten times my flat. Um, but I do not have six roommates, and uh, I have a functional door. I can leave any time I, I wish. And of course, in space, you don't have that luxury. Um, and, and often we see astronauts being very physically active and very, very, um, very keen on keeping their, their physical body. But I know that you've been working on, on also keeping the mind right. Of course, they are in a completely confined environment. Uh, it's non-stimulating, it's uh, clinical. Uh, it looks like a teenage room uh, with uh, computers on the table, not only on the table, but in the ceiling, uh, on the floor, on, on, the, on all walls. Uh, there's nothing to do, uh, there's nothing inspiring whatsoever uh, in relation to that. On ISS, they have the international, or the uh, cupola, which is this window where they can look down on, on the ground and uh, enjoy our planet, Earth. Uh, but going to the moon uh, or beyond, uh, there's not, I mean, in, initially there was not even a window on, on, uh, on uh, the lunar gateway, as it's called, the new uh, space station around the moon. Um, so there's nothing they can do to thrive apart from reading a book or watching a movie. Uh, on ISS, they can talk to their families or uh, talk to their friends 
but going to the moon or going to Mars, there will be a delay of 20, up to 22 minutes uh, talking to their family, which Oops. is, uh, it's a no-go. Be before, so, before getting ahead of ourselves. Yeah. Um, so he hasn't, he hasn't, he doesn't have a door. He, he lives a in door. a, what you describe as a, teen, a messy teenage room, but like times six. Yeah. Um, and, and, and what you gave him was a, a face computer. It's a face computer, yeah. It's you, uh, you can pick it up and maybe yeah, I can, I can pick the audience it up. It's and also table. have. A it's a set of. Uh, it's a VR headset, uh, and uh, what we uh, gave uh, Andreas was the opportunity to uh, put them on, and get away from uh, the ISS, so to say, in a virtual world, um, and that's kind of the only way you can get away from there, uh, and with the with the current headsets that you uh, are capable of of getting. This is, uh, they are a, a fantastic quality and a, a very good uh, sound image as well. So it's, it, it's almost like being there. And that's, that's, uh, that's the idea to stimulate and make the, the astronauts thrive. Uh, not so much on ISS, it's a pilot project, so it's the first time we have VR, VR in uh, space that actually works. But more when we go on the longer missions to the moon, which maybe is a year, or to Mars, which is maybe two or three years before they can get back. And it's a matter of getting, uh, we are sending whole people up there, uh, but it's also a matter of getting whole people back again to the ground. So, so what, what is Andreas uh, seeing? Is he playing Candy Crush or a lightsaber or, or what's, what's the deal? Well, it's uh, on the headset he has uh, on, uh, on ISS right now, he has uh, six movies. One is, uh, they are nine minutes each, and he selected them out of a portfolio of uh, VR movies. Uh, uh, I think we had uh, 20 movies or so, and it's uh, The Western Sea, it's uh, Tisvilehain in the northern part of Sealand. It's uh, swimming with the uh, dolphins. It's looking at uh, uh, some hills with the sunset in the back and birds uh, shivering in the background. It's uh, um, uh, sitting by a river that floats by with, uh, with some grass that's floating. And uh, it's the noise of the wind and some dogs barking. And uh, it's, it's very, very uh, calm and very, very still. Uh, but that's the whole uh, idea. It's to get this. Uh, a uh, few minutes of time off in uh, the very, very hectic and busy day that uh, the astronauts have uh, on board the ISS. And this all sounds well and good, but um, th does it work? How, how, do you, how do you know if it, you know, it makes me feel good? But um, on, on, on the project that we have uh, with Andreas right now, it's uh, limited to he answers a questionnaire prior to having a session and then after the session again. Um, and he rates these sessions 10 out of 10 each time, which is an indication that it's uh, actually he's enjoying it. I know that he was a bit s skeptical in the beginning, but I also know now that he's actually uh, enjoying it uh, after having been up there for, for, uh, for, for half a year, uh, being together with his colleagues and in this very confined and clinical environment. So one could say that even though they are just 3D surrounding video recordings. They're still better than the alternative of sitting in a can. It's not only the image that, uh, that, that he's, uh, uh, he likes, but it's just as much the sound, mm -hmm. uh, the sound of the birds and so on that I, I mentioned before. That, that's uh, just as important as, as the image itself. Uh, in future uh, versions of this, we will also measure uh, heart rate variability and skin response. Uh, so that we get uh, physical measurements of how it, it actually uh, impacts mm -hmm. uh, his, uh, his body or their bodies. I was thinking about um, one of the challenges with VR here in, on, on Earth. Back in the old days, you, had, you needed some infrastructure. Basically, you have, a, you have a computer that has a real keen sense of position and movement, and it's changing the image when you, when you move, move your head around. How do you manage that in, in space? Uh, on ground, uh, all the VR headsets that you can buy uh, uh, in the local store, uh, they are, uh, uh, when, you, when you move your head and you uh, need to know where you are inside the headset, uh, it's dependent on sensors called accelerometers and gyros. And, um, 
every time you move around, they respond, and what you see uh, inside the headset uh, is uh, in accordance with what they, uh, this information they give you. Gyros and accelerometers, they drift here on ground. It's not a problem whatsoever because uh, you have gravity. So you uh, level them out using gravity as a reference here on ground. But going to space, there's no gravity. Um, and these accelerometers and gyros, they drift to one side. And this poor astronaut, when he has the headset on, he will see the image going like this. Round, 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 and starts shaking and going around after just two minutes or so. Uh, when I started just, this project... Just as a uh, side note, I can personally attest to the, the way you get nauseous in the headsets are a special kind of evil compared to ordinary nausea. <laughs> yeah, 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 true. It, it, is, it is really bad when you have a bad headset. Yeah, 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 you get seasick uh, in a few, few minutes just there. Yeah. I'm sorry. Yeah, you get seasick in just a few minutes. Yeah, that. no, I, I interrupted you. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. Uh, uh, I mean, it, it's um, uh, it, it was uh, quite a challenge. I mean, we had we had originally uh, thought that it would be a piece of cake to just upload some uh, some nice videos to Andreas and then uh, uh, add this uh, skin response and heart rate variability monitor, and then he could use the headset which was already on board, ISS. ESA and NASA, they've been uh, working on this uh, since 2016. And uh, once I got, got into the work, uh, we realized that they would only work for just a few minutes. Uh, and then we realized that these, these films, they are, they are nine minutes or more. Uh, so we had to find a solution to this issue. Uh, and that was tricky. Uh, I mean, we've spent quite a bit of time going through uh, almost all the headsets you can buy, <laughs> finding, uh, trying to find solutions. Uh, and finally, we st uh, stumbled over uh, HTC in uh, Taiwan, who was uh, working on developing an application for big roller coasters in the US. Uh, instead of the gravity field, they use one of the controllers as, uh, as a reference. Um, so these accelerometers and um, and gyros on, on the headsets, which I mentioned before, instead of using the gravity field, uh, 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 leveling them out, they use the, the controller as a reference. Mm -hmm. So on the roller coasters, they would put the controller on the roller coaster and you would put the headset on. And your, what you see in your headset would follow your body and prevent you from uh, getting seasick. So what we did uh, actually was to replace the roller coaster with ISS, uh, which is a fairly big roller coaster. Um, How do you make sure? Um, one thing is uh, you mentioned, um, and you're more than welcome to chime in anytime. But but you mentioned it. It, it sounds like a piece of cake, but you know reality is often when you move out into it, the things it's always that were easy a piece to of look cake back or not. On what you did but, and then but you then found out, or you had this idea that that would actually work. How did you test that before going to the ISS? We tried two parabolic flights. Mm -hmm. uh, of course, you're only weightless for around 20 seconds in these parabolic flights. And but those at least are referred to as the vomit. Yeah, vomit a parabolic right, flight is when you have a, 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 a Boeing something, a big uh, uh, jet, and you uh, go in, into a parabolic flight from, from six kilometers to nine kilometers altitude and have this parabolic, and then you go down again, and then you experience 2G, and then up again. Um, and you are, have uh, t around 20 seconds of weightlessness. Uh, it's quite fun, I should say. You should try it. Um, but uh, but uh, it is, it, it, of course, it couldn't, we couldn't verify that it would work for these uh, number of minutes, but at least we verified that the solution uh, seemed to work. Mm -hmm. So the fir very first time he actually tried it on board was uh, quite, uh, quite scary, I would say. And it uh, turned out that it worked flawlessly, so it was fantastic. So um, just, just briefly here, um, one thing is Andreas, and he can get these sort of mental breaks and, and you know, sit at looking out at Vista and stuff like that. But how would this technology uh, does it have the science that you're doing now, that Andreas is doing now, would that have any impact on Earth? Uh, yes and no. 
I, I know, well, a part of science is you can never promise things, right? Uh, <laughs> you, can, you can hope that you will someday, I know. <laughs> no, of course, uh, like I mentioned before, I came to this, to think of this because of, of, the, of, the, of the lunar gateway. When I saw that, I thought, holy shit, they cannot thrive on this for several years. Uh, and and um, on ground, uh, people have started using this over the past few years for um, all sorts of a treatment of all si sorts of uh, psychological uh, uh, diseases, uh, PTSD, anxiety in all various forms and so on. So by using this in space and getting uh, the attention of all you guys and uh, media and so on, it's also uh, a very, very nice way of, of uh, showing to the public that this is actually a fantastic tool uh, to use uh, by psychologists and by uh, uh, various other means to treat these diseases. And also, of course, for, for, for handicapped people, who, people who are in, in bed or tied to a wheelchair or whatever, that they can get out of this uh, world, so to say, and into other worlds they can appreciate. So there are uh, very, very many uh, applications when you look at mental health care uh, where, where this is a fantastic tool and, and this whole thing of going to space is hopefully going to kind of lift this whole area. I, I, that's the ambition at least. Uh, we'll see what happens, but, but uh, a lot of uh, stuff is going on in that uh, respect as well. Thanks. I remember around 15 years ago or so, getting old, but 3D printers, they were all the rage, right? Um, you know, just close the retail stores because tomorrow people will just print whatever they need at home. Uh, obviously that did not pan out for a lot of reasons. Um, but in all fairness, uh, the technology, it wasn't the technology itself making promises, it was people making promises on behalf. And 3D printing is of course a thing. And you've been, uh, <laughs> um, um, and that's what I'd like to focus on now. So, so I know that you, Andreas, has a 3D printer with him. So um, why would you bring a 3D printer to space? Um, the printers that people have here on the ground that you can buy and use is typically a uh, polymer printer in plastic, has its limited uses, and that's also why it sort of died out again, because very little you can do with this except for making little models. In, uh, the one a lot of people would disagree. Yeah, I know, <laughs> but it's... Uh, different it's, tools it's, for it's different right, applications. Try to see what you can buy that is 3D printed, except from little rockets and stuff. The idea is that um, 3D printing in metal is a totally other animal. Um, here, because uh, the, the metal has to be fused from some material, the 3D printers we have here on the ground in metal are using typically a powder, a metal, that is fused by a laser, uh, and uh, then you layer by layer build it up, just like you do with the plastic printers. But the, uh, pla the powder would float around in space, so that cannot be used. Um, if you want to bring a 3D printer in space, for whatever reason, uh, then you need to use a different method, and that's actually what a, a task we took up with um, Airbus, which is one of the big uh, industries here uh, in Europe, um, to some years ago to see whether it was possible to do something that could be working in low gravity, mm -hmm. uh, first on the moon, later on the ISS. Well, you, you said yourself, for whatever reason, and so <laughs> let me re repeat my question, why would you do it? Yeah, that, there's a host of reasons. Uh, mm -hmm. The first one uh, is that if we go to Mars uh, and we have forgotten a screwdriver of a certain size, or some other tool that we need. Uh, a 3D printer could come in handy to uh, make spare parts or uh, things we have forgotten, uh, things that breaks or needs repair. Um, we do that all the time here at the ground. We just don't think about it that you can get stuff repaired. Uh, that is one thing, that's one use of it. Another one is that when you get into space, uh, there is no gravity as we just heard. Uh, and uh, well, the gravity is there, but you just can't feel it because it's cancelled out by the centrifugal force. So what happens is that um, the, um, uh, the, the, the way that things solidifies if you have melted it is different from here on Earth. Things cools off a lot slower uh, in space. It's because there's uh, no air. Uh, outside there's no air. This printer is inside in the ISS. Mm -hmm. But there's no convection 
because there's no gravity to drive the air flowing around. So they actually try to light a candle in the ISS. And what they, happens is that the candle turns on, I mean, you get a little flame, and it's just a little blue thing that actually dies out after a minute because the convection doesn't drive the air around. There's no gravity that gets the light air to go up. Mm -hmm. Same thing happens on the 3D print. So here, the, uh, the soil, the 3D printer would actually, uh, w uh, after it leaves the structure you do, it actually cools off very rapidly. That mm -hmm. won't happen in space. It gives a different metallic structure internally. So that's one of the things that we like to study. Um, we don't know what the result is going to be, but the speculation, at least the, the models we have, is that um, we will see a different crystal structure that supposedly, again, I cannot promise, but we think that the material we get printed in space will actually be much more thermoelastically stable, which is one of the biggest problems for anything we do here on the ground for stability of things. So my, my drive is, of course, to see whether we can be build bigger telescopes in space that are way better than uh, little things like uh, James Webb. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> I, I, I think some would beg to differ. I, I don't know if we've seen it on, on the screen, but I know we yeah. have an image of yours. Yeah, it's actually up there. That, that is the printer. That uh, is the printer itself, yeah. but also what, what you are currently printing, because as I, I understand, we're not... We're, oh, we're yeah. Not, we're not, we're not printing uh, bowls and no, stuff this like is, that? No, this is a model that we came up with. We wanted it to be much bigger, uh, but ESA, of course. ESA, who's paying for this, uh, <laughs> it, it said that uh, this is the size we can get. It's simply because the box uh, cannot be this big. So is that right. some sort of religious symbol, or no, what, what are you printing um, in space? It's actually the beginning, well, it's the beginning of a structure, uh, or the test structure, that where we can test these parameters I just talked about, the crystalline structure, residual stress, uh, the, uh, the, the actual uh, variation of crystal uh, uh, from in to the outside of the print, and uh, most importantly, the stability thereof. Mm -hmm. So this one is actually fitting nicely into an extremely nice piece of equipment we have down here at DTU. So when I get these prints back, I'll just put it into this machine where we try to measure its uh, thermoelastic uh, properties. Mm -hmm. So we look really forward to do this. And, and so 3D printing in space, you, you touched upon it, uh, going to Mars, you might not bring you know, a lot of screwdrivers, uh, or if you break some part, you, you might want to make a new one. Um, what other applications could you this potentially is, use? This is, in a way, a secret. Um, so <laughs> so e, e, there's nobody here from ESA, I suppose, so I can tell you. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> the, 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 the point is that... Um, uh, Airbus and we, what we try to do on the long run, I mean, not, not tomorrow, but in a, in a few years' time, is to try to make uh, very big structures in space from metal. Mm -hmm. uh, a launcher, a rocket, has a certain size, typically eight meters is the longest object you can bring into space. If you want to do a very long boom, for instance, it has to be maybe a kilometer long. Uh, if you have to do that, you have to bring it up from Earth first. If you make it down here, it has to be strong enough to carry itself on the rocket, and you have to assemble it from many, many little pieces. If we instead print those out in space, we can make them extremely thin, so the material use goes down actually a factor of 10,000. So we have to bring 10,000 times less mass into space to give you a truss of a, uh, of a kilometer. What would I use that for? Well, um, I like the thought of uh, free and indefinite energy for humanity that doesn't take up all fields and uh, places here at Earth. And you could put a solar farm up there. Uh, sim and I need that trust to keep the solar farm open. Here at Earth, uh, you need to make the solar cells very thick. In space, we can do them as thin as a plastic bag that you're not supposed uh, to buy at Netto. <laughs> but it's, um, but, the, but uh, it's, that's the thickness of a solar panel you can do. So the material use is actually extremely uh, uh, small in space. So that means that uh, eventually we will be able to do electricity much cheaper in space than we do on Earth. And the sun shines 24 seven. We do not take up room for other people. And um, so to me, that sounds like uh, actually a noble goal. And that's what we're working towards here. It does sound like a noble goal. Also a uh, quite lofty one. It's, I mean, it's the sci-fi classic, and now you're, not, you're not beginning really. to chip away at the problem now. No, 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 I mean, we already have small solar farms up there. They're just very small, you, you know, like this podium. 
we do have transmitted the energy to ground using microwaves, so we know it can be done. Now we need to see whether we can scale it up, and that's where the problem is. So um, I'd like to turn to Tor Davies, uh, the, the last of the, the experiments that we will be focusing on today. Um, and Davies, in this regard, is not a name. It's Dynamic Active Pixel Vision Sensor. Uh, maybe we'll get into that. Um, but here on Earth, we see lightning as these jagged white lights. But there's so much more to thunderstorms than that. Um, things in color and things that you have to see from above. Um, so this Tort Davies project, what, what is it? What is it? Oh, the, uh, the, the actual camera is a uh, precursor uh, for a future mission that we like to make. Uh, the idea is that uh, Andreas, uh, when he goes to the station, is allowed to bring little instruments with him, and this camera is not so big. So uh, to bring that up here means that we can make a test of this technology to see whether it can be used uh, in the future. The thing, the, when you talk about lightning uh, uh, here on Earth, there's usually a cloud overhead, and that cloud prevents you from seeing up. For that reason, we didn't know that there are also energy discharges on the other side of the cloud. Nowadays, everybody knows, oh, of course there are uh, uh, discharges on the other side. We just didn't know at the time. Mm -hmm. um, so the thing is that uh, once we first saw this, actually we did that many years ago from Pic de Midi, an observatory where we can look over the southern France down to the clouds, and then we realized something is going on that's really fishy. That led to the first Danish um, payload for the ISS, real big payload, uh, the uh, ASIM uh, mm -hmm. experiment. And this one has confirmed, yes, a, a lot of stuff goes on. Also, these nice colored things, uh, uh, dwarfs and elves, as they are called. But, but if the thing is that there's more than that that goes on, and that's what this camera is for. Mm -hmm. And yeah, I'm curious as to uh, one thing is, as John mentioned, we have you know pretty, pretty colored lightnings at different shapes. But how does that affect the atmosphere? How do electrical phenomena affect what's going on with the climate? If only we knew. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> That's what uh, Andreas's research project is about. Is actually to find out why, how, do, how do you generate these lightnings, and what does it actually mean for the whole structure of the atmosphere? But, but help me out. I'm, I am a, a, a journalist by trade, right? One of the humanists. So, okay. so, yeah. so how how would lightning think of it differently? You, the Earth itself, if that was a ball you had here in your hand. Some people uh, believe it's a ball. Oh, yeah. mm. okay. yeah. Other, others. <laughs> we will hypothesize it. But we hypothesize a round object. Yeah. Uh, the, the layer of air, the one we call the atmosphere, is a layer that is actually thin as a piece of paper on top of this. That what we think of the universe, I mean, as humans down here, uh, is just this thin layer of about five kilometers where people can live. Uh, about, and then some, and though most of the clouds with the lightning actually is just a few kilometers up. There are also uh, clouds further up in 10 kilometers. But about that, and uh, before we get to space, which is about 100 kilometers up, there's a lot of room where things going on that we never could measure on the ground. The reason is that uh, no airplane can go up there, no stratospheric balloon can get, uh, get up there, and uh, on the outside, the spa uh, spacecraft cannot go down because they burn up from the friction. So this region, which is actually an energy transporter, from the sunlight in and the heat radiation out, and of course the discharges that you get from the lightnings um, is actually pretty much uncharted land. So it's one of the white spots. And um, we think that there's a huge energy transport along, going along with this. And at least there's a molecular transport going along with it. So uh, the, our atmosphere is very structure is actually also defined by these discharges. So that makes it interesting from a you know, geophysical perspective, mm -hmm. from an atmospheric physicist's a wet dream. Uh, for the climate people, something to look into. So there's a lot of things that we need to know, we just don't know yet. And, and for this, it, it, this event camera is uh, extremely fast. So the cameras which has been in, the space, in space to measure these things uh, prior to this uh, Tor Davis experiment, uh, they, they are not as fast as the, the event camera that uh, Andreas now has, has uh, with him. 
And combining the, uh, the optical images you can get out of a normal camera with this event camera gives you some of the very, very fine structures in these events and uh, it tells you uh, more about their origin, origin and, uh, and also how they kind of uh, evolve. And that, that's something which is also interesting for the, for the scientists to, to investigate, but to figure out what the impact is. I'm and it goes further than just our own planet, right? Because if we look at exoplanets, what we can hope to observe is the outer atmosphere, right? So if we don't even understand our own outer atmosphere, how are we ever going to understand other planets out of atmosphere mm -hmm. so it's a uh, and then i guess i mean it's been the hot dream i think of many scientists that if we could just have its uh, lightning we would have lots of energy so if you've seen back to the future you know <laughs> you know <laughs> <it wouldn't laughs> but, but but i'm curious as to how you you mentioned this this event camera how a very high sort of temporal resolution how how does that well that's quite simple inform us it's quite simple i mean if you have a, uh, a, a device that is measuring uh, a certain level of light on it, that will be one of the pixels. If that uh, pixel is just stable, it does nothing, this device. There's a little amplifier next to it that actually measures if the, 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 the thing changes in level. And if the, a little more light is ha being had in this, this pixel, it reports this out. Mm -hmm. And uh, that this means that uh, the, I the individual pixel can be read out extremely fast and you actually see the rise in the, this, uh, this pixel. And that is exactly the principle used in these event cameras. That is that you do not wait to take one exposure. You only read out those that did change and you only amplify those that have a big change. And since uh, you can see the ge geometry that it moves about, then of course different people, pixels will be read out. So it, it's equivalent to getting about 100,000 images per second, mm -hmm. which you cannot do with normal cameras. So this is extremely good at getting rapid variations, but really poor at landscapes. So it's a bit like whether you want to back up your whole computer or just back up what you did the past week, right? It's just faster to mm -hmm. back up what you only did the last week. So um, we're, we're, we're getting ready to the, uh, the transmission. Um, but I'm curious because usually fast cameras also means very big cameras and power hungry cameras. But that is not the case here. No, because each little pixel, which is a, about a, a four microns across, uh, has an amplifier sitting there below it. And everything inside this is almost no energy. Remember, you do not need to read out the entire a camera in, at this pace, that would have costed you a power bank the size of a full-size Tesla. This, this thing here is uh, it's just a little, bit, a little thing, and you only need to get the information of the change out. So that's actually how you say, uh, save it. I mean, just like Anya put it, instead of dumping your entire hard drive, you only uh, move the changes to your, your backup store. Mm -hmm. So Andreas, he's currently, um, he's, he's been doing these where he sits in the cupola and, and and um, looks at the clouds from above. Are there any... Alrighty. I think I'm sorry. Oh, oh yes. I think we're Houston, ready. Houston, I am ready for the event. <laughs> ISS, this is... Isa, this is Mission Control Earth. Houston. Please call station for a voice check. ISS, this is Denmark, DTU, can you hear us? Hello, I've got you loud and clear, and welcome to the International Space Station. Thank you very much. Hi, Andreas, thank you for uh, taking time to speak with us today. We're around uh, 1,000 people today. Can you tell us, where are you currently? Uh, we are somewhere over the Atlantic Ocean, flying uh, southeast uh, down towards South Africa before we turn northeast again over uh, Southeast Asia. So somewhere over the Atlantic. Sweet. As an astronaut, part of your job is to conduct experiments and collect data for various re research projects. Is there a project that you have done on your mission that has made a particular impression on you? Well, we have so many uh, high technology experiments up here uh, that uh, the, you know, every day is, is exciting. Um, one of my uh, uh, 
experiments that I'm very fascinated in is the 3D metal, pr metal printer that you've been discussing today. Um, but we also have something a little bit different, though similar, called the biofabrication facility, which essentially is a 3D printer for human tissues. And that's one of the experiments we've also been working on. Uh, and we're trying to print uh, human tissues uh, or simulants of uh, organs even, and the idea being that maybe in the future uh, we will be able to print human organs and use that for transplants instead of relying on uh, organ donors. So uh, some very, very fascinating uh, high technology experiments that we're doing up here. Things are indeed moving fast here on stage. We just talked to John about making a screwdriver and now you're talking about human organs. It's a pleasure to watch science in action. But my question in the, in the, in my panel, in the panel here, we discussed uh, your experiments with VR. Um, in your own words, how has it been using this VR headset to sort of uh, go to another place than the ISS while you've been there? Yeah, it's actually one of my favorite uh, activities on board the space station, using this VR headset. Uh, I use it for, for two things. One is for mental health, where I have a chance to uh, relax, um, enjoy a scene of, uh, from nature on Earth, and just kind of de-stress, uh, catch my breath. Um, and the second thing I use it for is uh, exercising. It uh, can uh, be combined with our bicycle on uh, the space station, and then I can bike five different routes in Denmark, including a mountain bike trail in Silkeborg, uh, a trail around the lakes in central Copenhagen, um, a trail along the beach in Jutland, and it's it's absolutely one of my favorite things to do because it makes me feel like I'm out in nature, uh, riding on my bike rather than sitting on a stationary bicycle on board the uh, uh, space station. It's also a lot more motivating because it's tied in with the the uh, mechanical uh, system of the bicycle. So when I when it looks like I'm biking uphill, I feel uh, that I need to put in more power into the pedals. And when I'm biking downhill inside the VR headset, I, it, it becomes easier. And so it's coupled together that way for a really immersive experience that is just, it takes me out of the space station and puts me into nature and I love it. So two follow-up questions to that. Um, how do you feel it has affected you? And do you keep the headset to yourself or do you let your colleagues use it also? <laughs> well, it certainly uh, improves my uh, mental health, I would say, and also just my um, just daily life up here because I feel like I get to, to go out into nature once in a while. And uh, my crewmates have tried it. Uh, they can also use it and uh, they love it as well. It, it really makes, especially biking, uh, much more pleasant rather than sitting staring into a blank wall and trying to motivate your... Reasonably stay in space? Well, it's difficult to say because I think humans are remarkably resilient. Uh, we uh, are capable of much more than we uh, imagine on a, on a daily basis. So I don't think that we as humans will be the weakest link when we uh, are exploring space. Um, now, having said that, there's a difference between surviving and living. And uh, having virtual reality uh, that lets you imagine or feel like you're back on Earth, feel like you're back with your family or feel like you're back uh, in nature can really improve uh, sort of your 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 mental well-being, your your uh, psychological well-being, and I think can can do a uh, make a tremendous uh, improvement overall. So it's definitely something that uh, that we can use. Um, I just spoke to John, and he was very uh, very uh, excited about 3D printing. Um, do you have any updates for for John? How is his his 3D printer? Well, the good news, I was able to successfully install it in our Columbus laboratory this week. So it is all uh, set to go. Uh, what we're now waiting for is a checkout and commissioning phase, uh, which will be run primarily from our uh, European Columbus uh, control center located just outside of Munich. Uh, 
that checkout and commissioning phase will probably take a, a couple of weeks, meaning that most likely, unfortunately, I'll be back on Earth before uh, we're ready to actually print something. But it just means that uh, I'll be able to follow along from Earth and, and see the next crew, Expedition uh, 71, get a chance to, to actually do the printing. But uh, otherwise, the, the, the printer is set up and it's ready to, go, to get checked out. We trust that some of your colleagues will bring home prints for John. Um, you touched upon it just before about um, expectations and 3D printing potentially of human organs, but sticking to the metal, what, what, do you, what are your expectations concerning that technology when it comes to space? Well, that certainly is a, uh, a potential big game changer for uh, spaceflight. Uh, on board the International Space Station, we are very reliant on resupply uh, from Earth. Uh, at least once a month or every two months, uh, we are, receive a cargo vehicle. Um, and on that cargo vehicle is a lot of spare parts. You know, the space station is incredibly, uh, an incredibly complex structure with lots of mechanical, electromechanical components that just tend to get worn down over time, which means that we spend a lot of our time maintaining these systems and repairing these systems and replacing uh, parts that are worn out or broken. Um, you know, to truly explore uh, deep space, if we want to go to the moon for long periods of time, and especially if we want to go to Mars, uh, we have to be much more self-sufficient, which also means being able to produce our own spare parts. And metal 3D printing is a key technology there. Um, but it goes beyond human spaceflight. Um, you know, if, if, if satellites um, could print, for example, large booms or solar arrays, that will also uh, lift the restriction on size because satellites, anything we launch into space is restricted by the size of the fairing on top of a rocket. And so metal 3D printing or 3D printing in general can really um, enhance what we can achieve and what we can do uh, when it comes to space exploration. Um, going over to another one of your projects, the, um, the photography thing, the Tort Davies project, uh, we've seen some of your amazing... A few lightning, and other times you get out there and it's just an enormous uh, thunder system with lightning going off uh, in all the windows. Uh, and really the, the most difficult part is choosing where to point the camera uh, sometimes because there's just lightning flashes everywhere and you just kind of have to cross, uh, you know, cross your fingers and hope that uh, you're pointing the camera in the absolute best direction and you're going to capture one of those elusive red sprites or blue jets. So um, besides just being fascinating and pretty uh, photos, how does this data actually um, inform climate research, you think? Well, on one level, it's um, what you could call uh, basic research, right? It's about understanding uh, the planet that we live on and the atmosphere. This is a, a phenomenon that's not well understood. Uh, and so anything we learn about it is going to make us uh, smarter about our planet and, and the atmosphere. But more uh, specific to your question, um, we tend to view weather phenomenon as being isolated to the troposphere. Uh, above the troposphere is the stratosphere. Usually we don't see weather phenomena up there, uh, but these giant lightning strikes um, are a way for weather phenomenon to uh, occur in the stratosphere and to move gaseous uh, molecules from the troposphere up into the stratosphere. For example, water vapor. And water vapor is a, a very strong uh, greenhouse gas. Uh, and so this is a uh, potentially something that we need to understand better and to account for in our climate models if we want to uh, better understand uh, our climate and, and how it evol evolves and how it's impacted uh, by things like lightning. I know it's an impossible task to choose among your favorite children, but if you should, um, what, is, what is the most important contribution you hope that your research has, on the ISS has been? Well, I would say it's a little abstract, but I think the most important thing that we're doing up here is preparing for the future, for a better future, um, a future 
where we are much more knowledgeable, uh, much more insightful, uh, but also have uh, a much broader horizon. Um, we're up here doing scientific research to improve knowledge, but at the same time, we're also pushing uh, the boundary of you know, human civilization. Uh, I hope that 50 years from now, 100 years from now, 500 years from now, that we will see humans um, on the moon and potentially uh, even on Mars. Um, so that's really what I'm hoping that my work on board the International Space Station uh, is leading towards, is, is uh, a future, a better future, a brighter future, uh, but also a future where humans um, are exploring space uh, further and deeper than we've done so far. Obviously, being on the space station is an amazing adventure, for lack of a better word. But what do you look forward to in your job professionally uh, when you get back to Earth? Well, this is an incredibly exciting time uh, in space exploration, not just human uh, space exploration, but in general. And so I look forward to uh, getting back to the Earth and, and continuing to support um, our upcoming missions, especially as we return to the moon uh, with the Artemis missions. Um, you know, there's a, a very good chance that we'll see a European astronaut uh, as part of uh, an Artemis mission to the moon. And I think that's incredibly exciting that we as Europe, that the next generation of Europeans will have a, uh, a chance to explore the moon. Uh, and so, you know, basically uh, supporting that in whatever role I can, uh, either as an astronaut or as an engineer, that's what I'm uh, particularly looking forward to. Okay, we do have a bit of time before uh, we have some questions from students. I'm curious, as you're about to leave the space station, what will you miss about your everyday life on board the ISS? Well, uh, a lot of things, for example, this. <laughs> you know, be, being able to fly, being uh, weightless is just so much fun. Uh, but otherwise, I'm going to really miss uh, looking out of the window. Uh, sitting in Cupola, looking at our beautiful planet is one of the most spectacular and breathtaking things that we can do up here. And so that I would say in particular, and then just, you know, having fl fun in, in weightlessness. That Kubla window seems to be the best window, well, not in the world, but in the universe, maybe. Um, it's time for student questions. Our first student is Mikkel Hansen. Please give him uh, a hand. Thank you. And Andreas, my question to you is, what is your advice to students dreaming of going to space, both in terms of career decisions, but also developing personal skills? Well, you know, the, the basic uh, requirements to become an astronaut are that you need to have a background in STEM. So in science, technology, engineering, uh, medicine, um, that's kind of the key thing. Um, you also need to be a, a good uh, team player. Uh, everything that we do up here is, is as part of a team, whether it's the team of astronauts on board the space station or the entire team, uh, including the ground teams in mission control, uh, that work to support us on a, on a daily basis. Um, you know, those are the kind of the two fund fundamentals. Um, uh, but otherwise, my, my advice uh, to any young person um, is to be flexible and to take those opportunities that arise. It's very easy to fixate on a goal and to think that you know how to reach that goal. Uh, but oftentimes in life, it's not the straight line that takes you to the goal. It's the you know the the meandering path where you where you take opportunities that don't seem to be directly related but yet somehow end up affecting you in a way that takes you closer to your goal so be flexible take the opportunities that arise in life because it's very hard to predict what it is that will lead you eventually to your goal thank you very much and our next student question is from laura esther Ising. yeah uh, hi, Andreas. I, I was wondering what your favorite kind of experiment is to conduct on the ISS. Well, my favorite experiment would be one where I'm actively participating uh, in the scientific 
uh, process, you know, where I'm helping to make the discoveries, you know, using my hands. Um, there are so many different experiments up here, ranging from experiments just like that, where we're actually uh, participating in the process, uh, all the way to other experiments where we are essentially, um, you know, mounting uh, a black box, turning it on, and then letting the experiment uh, run autonomously in, in, in the background. Uh, but the ones where I'm actively involved are the ones that are, are my favorite. Thank you. All righty. Uh, Andreas, thank you so much for taking time to answer questions today. Um, say hello to all of your colleagues. We wish you safe travels around the planet and back down when that time comes. Give Andreas a big hand. Well, thank you so much. It was an absolute pleasure talking with you today, and I look forward to uh, seeing many of you hopefully soon when I'm back on Earth. <laughs> well, that was just about it. John Life, Pierre, Enya, thank you for coming today. Please give him a round of applause. And also, thank you to PTU for hosting this event. Thank you to everyone in the audience. Thanks for singing with me. That was a great pleasure. And last but not least, uh, I have been informed that there's a five corner Freitas bar at Eshuset. So now you know. Have a good weekend.